Hello, my sweet strangelings. It is officially summer, and life's too short for a day without fun. So whether you're at the beach or traveling for a vacation, you can get a thrill wherever you need it with Slotomania, the world's number one free slots game. Slotomania is a unique gaming experience with really beautiful graphics, huge jackpots, and fun freebies. When your day is feeling stale, just ask, what will today spin? If you're 21 or older, you can join millions of players around the world. Download Slotomania on the App Store or Google Play Store for 1 million free coins. Hello, my spooky friends. I'm Blair Bathory, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. Thank you for joining us, whether it's your first time delving into the darkness or if you are brave enough to make a return visit. Welcome. The nighttime can be filled with magic, the fun parties, staying up late, hanging out with friends, getting to gaze upon the moon and the stars. But nighttime can also bring out the worst in us, when we believe that no one can see us in the dark. Is the time for all the nighttime creepers to feel most alive. First, alone in the dark, followed by man's best friend or worst enemy. Then, a monster in the woods. Finally, in our featured story, not every frog turns into a prince. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at something scary at snarled.com. If you'd like to support Something Scary, then consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, not only can you help the show and see ad-free episodes, but you can also be a part of the horror and hear your name featured in one of our podcast or weekly video stories. Visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, wanna hear something scary? Creepers of the Night. As children, we are warned about strangers for good reason. But as adults, we sometimes forget the danger. Like in this episode by Stephanie Raybig, one of our featured writers for Pride Month. Her work includes the horror western on Stolen Land, the creature feature playing Possum, and the Cryptids and Cauldron series. I love being outside at night. It makes me feel safe. That hasn't always been the case, me being a woman and all, but the lure is irresistible. I listen to the crickets, sometimes cicadas or an owl. I watch the moon waxing and waning. I lean against the front of our house and close my eyes and pretend I'm the only person around for miles. Which, aside from Veronica sitting inside and watching another Lost Treasure documentary, I am. I try not to miss my nightly cigarette. Been three years since I met Veronica and quit smoking. She has a very sensitive nose, but I can still feel the cigarette between my fingers when I'm out here alone. Tonight, a car engine breaks the silence, and I reluctantly open my eyes when it stops instead of passing on by. The car's parked in front of our mailbox, and a man gets out. He's smiling in a way that I'm sure he thinks is reassuring, but has me wanting to run for the front door. I won't make it. Hi, beautiful. I seem to be lost, trying to find my aunt's house, but I got in too late to really see the street signs clearly. Ran into a hell of a lot of traffic because of highway construction, he says, moving closer and I think of a book I'd read a million times as a teenager, The Gift of Fear, and how one of the signs of a manipulator is someone who tries to drown you in useless details to keep you from focusing on the big picture. My big picture is that I'm alone out here. It's dark, and he's close and getting steadily closer as he chatters on. Just please get back in your car, I say. My voice soft, because if I yell at him, If I let Veronica know there's a problem and she comes out to confront this man, instead of listening, he narrows his eyes. Hey, no need to be rude. I just need directions is all. 
he looks around, checking for neighbors, for lights on, for anyone who might be close enough to help me. Then he refocuses on me, a tiny bit of nerves showing now, and I wonder if he's tried anything like this before, or if I'm the first crime of opportunity he's seen. He's pretty young, maybe 19 or 20. I stare back at him, waiting to see what decision he'll make. His expression turns hard, and he grabs my arm, yanking me towards his waiting car. I've been trying to stay calm, trying to tell myself this won't get as bad as so. So many stories I've heard from other women, but his grip is painfully tight, and fear tears through me despite my best efforts to keep it back. Let go. Shut up, he mutters, dragging me towards the road. His driver's side door is open, but the passenger side isn't. When he opens the door, I can twist away, get back inside, tell Veronica what happened. She'll be pissed, but she won't be out here. Everything will be fine. I glance to the moon, my steady moon, for comfort, and the man punches me in the side of the head. The world spins, darkening a bit, the moon blurring in my vision. I hear the passenger door open, and I give up. Veronica! I scream. Shut up, he repeats, shoving me into the car. I go limp, ending up partly in the passenger seat with my legs dangling out onto the road. He snarls a curse and grabs at me, trying to push me fully into the car, and then suddenly his hands are gone. My wife is here. Hey, the man begins, but whatever he's about to say dies as Veronica lunges forward, sinking her teeth into his neck, tearing open his throat. I stand up, moving into his line of sight, watching curiously as the panic and confusion fade from his eyes, leaving nothing. I feel no grief for him, not even any disgust at his bloody end. After all, I'd given him every chance to drive away. I sigh. I just wanted a peaceful evening, and now I'd have to get rid of his car. The body won't be a problem. Veronica's very experienced in dealing with those. I love being outside at night. It makes me feel safe. Of course, it doesn't hurt that my wife is a vampire. Have you ever felt like you were being watched? Would you like the protection of a vampire? Or would you always fear that you might be their next victim? Tell us what you think and send us an email at something scary at snarled.com. Is the real world getting a little too mundane? Why not add a dash of magic with an exciting new gaming experience? Harry Potter Puzzles and Spells. Escape your everyday into a world of magical puzzles, experiencing one of the most innovative match three games on the market. And celebrating the original Harry Potter stories. In Harry Potter Puzzles and Spells, you'll cast spells to overcome fiendish challenges, conquer trolls and coral chocolate frogs. Take your game to the next level by collecting a magical creature to help you become an even more powerful player. Take on the challenge by yourself or enhance your experience by teaming up with other players to earn rewards. But no matter how you play, make sure you have your wits about you. These puzzles will test any player's match through mastery. The magic is waiting. Download Harry Potter Puzzles and Spells for free from the iOS App Store or Google Play today. Dogs are well known to be man's best friend and will go to great lengths to protect their humans. So if your pet is too frightened to go outside, something must be wrong. Like in this story written by Janine Pipe. We live in the middle of nowhere, but with three brothers and lots of animals to tend to, I never get bored. Although it does suck that you have to drive about 30 minutes to the nearest store. Being so far out of town also means that there are no streetlights. So when it gets dark, it is dark. But it's okay. We have nothing to worry about all the way out here. We keep horses and several dogs. They are meant to be working guard dogs, but, well, let's just say they're part of the family. Max may be a huge German Shepherd, originally intended for security duty, but he's a giant softy and now sleeps on my bed. And if he ever gets agitated, I know something is wrong. But, as luck would have it, things always happen when your parents are out of town, right? 
My parents were visiting Mima in Detroit, which was around a four-hour drive with my two little brothers, leaving me and Jackson in charge for the week. He must have been fast asleep, but Max was fussy and whining, which was really unlike him, and I was worried he'd wake the other two dogs, Callie and Baxter, who were in the kitchen. Sure enough, I could hear them scratching about, and it sounded like Callie was growling. I decided to get up and see what was going on. It wasn't unusual for a deer or something to wander closer to the house. As I padded down the stairs, I could hear the horses were whining too. Maybe a storm was brewing. I grabbed the keys and a flashlight, intending to go check on them when I heard the noise. Growling, and it was coming from outside. Max was now behind me, tail between his legs. Callie and Baxter had moved away from the door and cowering under the table. My immediate concern was a wolf. There hadn't been any scene around here since us kids had been born, but it was all I could think of. I crept up to the screen door and peered out. If there was a wolf out there, there was no way I was going to try and scare it off. And then I saw it. At first, it didn't register, probably because I didn't want to believe my eyes. It made no sense. The thing standing outside wasn't a wolf. To be completely honest, I didn't know what it was. The creature was tall and bipedal with jet black fur. Its limbs and torso, despite the hair, were muscular and seemed humanoid, but there was where any similarity ended. Because its head was so very much not human, Oh no, the thing had a head of a dog, a very similar head to Baxter, who was part Doberman Pinscher. Only whilst Baxter was doing his best to hide, this beast was staring right into my eyes through the glass, ears back and teeth bared. I knew enough about animal behavior to know whatever that thing was, it was ready to attack. And by the sheer size of it, I wasn't entirely sure the mere wood and glass of the door was enough to keep it at bay. Just as I was debating whether to join the dogs and hide or call to my brother who was a ridiculously deep sleeper, the creature began to ram itself against the door, making the entire kitchen shake. The plates on the dresser began to rock precariously and Max started to howl. Jackson! I screamed, hoping the commotion would wake the teenager who could sleep like the dead. The animal rammed against the door again and I saw the glass begin to crack, a spider web forming as it weakened. I knew it wouldn't take much more when suddenly, We were all blinded by a brilliant light from outside and an extremely loud guitar solo. It was Jackson's truck. I had just presumed he was in bed and hadn't even considered that he would have taken advantage of our parents being away to break curfew by several hours. I screamed again and he ran inside to find the dogs and I in a pile on the floor. Although he hadn't seen the beast, he took one look at the door to see I was telling the truth. Being way braver than the dogs, he grabbed the flashlight and a baseball bat and stood on the porch. Thankfully, whatever had been out there had been frightened away by bright headlights. Once he was confident the creature had gone, he boarded up the broken window and we sat together the rest of the night in a fully lit kitchen armed with bats, just in case. The following morning, we checked the property. Thankfully, the horses appeared fine. So we did all what modern teenagers do in a situation like this. We Googled it. And that's when we discovered the legend of the Michigan Dog Man. Case after case of unexplained sightings, damage to property, livestock mauled, and worst of all, people missing. Survivors told their tales, how they had witnessed this monster, seen it dragging away a friend or family member, but by the time they had gotten help, there was no trace of the beast nor body. We sat reading, filled with shock and fear, It seemed we had a very lucky escape this time. Now we would have to prepare ourselves, not for if, but for when the dog man came back. Do you have a pet that protects you? Would they guard you and your property if a cryptid came calling? Have you ever encountered something like the dog man? Hello, my sweet strangerlings. It is officially summer and life's too short for a day without fun. So whether you're at the beach or traveling for a vacation, you can get a thrill wherever you need it with Slotomania, the world's number one free slots game. Slotomania is a unique gaming experience with really beautiful graphics, huge jackpots, and fun freebies. 
and the rush you feel when you win a big jackpot is horrifyingly amazing. Get 1 million free coins when you download Slotomania to kickstart the fun. And new features are added daily, including fun mini games and your very own pet cheetah, Aurora. <laughs> so cute. When your day is feeling stale, just ask, what will today spin? If you're 21 or older, you can join millions of players around the world. Download Slotomania, the number one free slots game on the App Store or Google Play Store and get 1 million free coins. That's Slotomania on the App Store or Google Play Store for 1 million free coins. Family vacations can seem like a bore when you're a teen and you might find yourself hoping for some excitement. Nikki R. Lee, one of our featured writers for Pride Month, shares in this tale. Nikki creates horror-inspired toys and comics and has horror poetry published in books like Field Notes from a Nightmare. Denny didn't know much about hitting the open road with her parents, but what she did know was that so far she hated every second of it. Life in the RV had been nauseating and sweltering in the summer heat, but Denny just kept telling herself it couldn't possibly last much longer because there was only so much of Ohio left to see. Denny's parents were born for this stuff. Loveland, their current camping location, was just as desolate as the last. For the first time since Denny could remember, she wished summer would hurry up and end. Denny was trying to soak in the last vestiges of the broken AC when her mom yelled from outside. Denny, mom said. We can hear some beautiful running water calling your name. That got Denny to sit up. If there was one thing she'd enjoyed this trip, it was finding solace by way of a babbling creek. She considered herself something of an amateur frog catcher, a skill she'd fine-tuned over her teenage years while dragged on these trips. The phone in her pocket was filled with pictures of various amphibians, all of which she had caught and released. The RV door slammed shut behind Denny, alerting her moms to her departure. Not too long, mom said. Be back before dark, mother said. Denny waved before heading in the direction of the running water. She walked at least five minutes before cresting a hill. Below, a river gurgled and frothed. She couldn't believe how alive it looked. It was practically steaming, like a long jacuzzi. Denny followed the river upstream when she heard it. A croak, long and raspy, deep like it came from a bulbous throat. She stopped, trying to find the direction it came from. The tree line nearly a hundred yards behind her. The croak came again, bouncing off the river top like a rock skipped. No, not the trees, but perhaps from the other embankment. Denny couldn't shake the throatiness of the croak. It was so much louder than she was used to. Less like it came from a frog that could fit in her hand. More human-sized. Croak. Denny's skin vibrated. That sound, not small at all, like someone imitating a frog. Denny neared the river, feeling the heat from the water radiating from the surface. The noise was surely coming from the water, like the river itself was orchestrating amphibious percussions. She peered into the river, her reflection broken by the choppy water, shards of herself with eyebrows pinched and confused, her reflection pieced back together. Her face puckered, covered in warts, growing, a mouth wide, eyes bugging out. It didn't look like her. It wasn't her. Staring back through the veneer of the river was the face of a frog. The face of a frog, man. It breached the water, grinning. A rotund body with bent, long legs propelling it forward. A human-sized frog. It reached for Denny with skinny arms, webbing between digits that slapped against her skin. Denny screamed, hoping her moms would hear and pull her from the creature that grabbed her from the water. The river seemed to boil with a newfound intensity. Denny tripped as she was lurched away from the slimy frog man. She crab walked, her hands grasping weeds, trying to find purchase in the wet embankment. The creature reached again for her, the warts on its face distorting its wide grin. A croaking from the river turned both Denny's and the frog man's heads towards the bubbling water more deep-throated yells, 
dozens, Denny realized, inside tightening in fear, unsure of how she would run away from not one, but all the frogmen whose voices rose like an aggressive tide. The creature nearest leapt forward, springing from strangely bent legs, his wet fingers grasping for her throat. The bumpy digits grazed her skin, reeking of rotten river scum. The warm fingers sent shivers down Denny's spine as they began to wrap around her neck. Denny! She heard from just over the hill. The croaks intensified from the river, heads bobbing and breaking the surface, angrily vocalizing. The fingers tightened around her neck, and Denny felt the air in her chest constricting painfully. The grip tightened, and just as Denny felt herself slipping into unconsciousness, she heard a loud croak swirling around her in haze. The grip loosened. Denny gasped for air, wondering why the frogman let go. As her vision returned, she saw it wading back into the river to join its colony. By some miracle, the creature retreated, as if the croaks called it back to the water's edge. Denny ran up the hill before turning around, seeing the frogman still no further than it was before. She pulled out her phone to take a picture, but the frogman had other ideas. It removed a stick, gnarled and wet from its hip, and wasted no time pointing it in her direction. Her phone jolted in her hand, an electric shock shutting it off and sending sparks into the air. Denny took it as a sign that this was one frog she shouldn't be catching, and ran the rest of the way back to the RV, occasionally finding the eyes of the frogmen glinting in the setting sun. Have you ever encountered something freaky in the woods? Was it supernatural? Were there any other eyewitnesses to this encounter? Tell us about it at something scary at snarled.com. In many cultures, frogs have been known to symbolize transformation, prosperity, and fertility. But not all frogs bring good fortune. Ivan hated science class. He felt like dissecting animals was cruel and there were other ways to learn about anatomy. When his teacher, Mr. Johnson, insisted that Ivan cut up the frog with the rest of the class, Ivan couldn't bring himself to do it. Instead, he discreetly shoved the frog in his backpack and took it home with him. His lab partner, Alejandra, covered for him, since she also had no desire to dissect a formerly living thing. At lunch, they met up in the bathroom and took the frog out of Ivan's backpack. But looking closely, they noticed it had two extra legs. Ivan decided to name it Gaston. He knew the frog was dead, but decided he would give it a proper burial at his house. It felt like the right thing to do after all. After school, Ivan dug a hole in his backyard. He said a prayer for Gaston, putting him in a tiny box and buried him. He placed some flowers from his garden on top of the pile of dirt. Ivan was restless that night. Usually, he fell asleep as soon as his head hit the pillow and not waking up until the alarm would go off. Instead, he tossed and turned all night in between dreams of being chased by frogs. He finally gave in around 6 a.m., feeling groggy and grumpy. He decided to check the site before he headed to school and noticed that the dirt surrounding Gaston's grave had been disturbed. He thought that was very strange, but assumed it was a nosy wild animal and would take a closer look after school. That evening, while Ivan was in his bedroom doing homework, he heard a strange noise coming from his closet. He cautiously made his way towards the sound. He opened the door slowly. He didn't see anything. Then the noise sounded again, and there on the floor was Gaston. He was staring at Ivan with icy blue eyes. Ivan was in shock. The creature had been dead when it was given to him in class and he buried it. He called the only person who would believe him, Alejandra. Alejandra rushed over to have a look and confirmed that this was the frog from class with the two extra legs. She then pulled out her phone and Googled the frogs with extra limbs. The first thing to come up was the handbook of Slavic folklore. Within the same link, she learned about the Bukovac and found an image that looked just like Gaston. The ancient creature was a demonic monster with icy blue eyes, six limbs, and horns that killed everything in its way. Then it exploded, giving birth to hundreds of tiny Bukovacs. 
Alejandra explained to Ivan that they needed to get rid of this creature immediately. As she bent down to scoop up Gaston, she felt a burning sensation on her fingers. Before she could drop the frog, they watched in horror as the skin on her hand melted off. Alejandra screamed in pain before passing out. While Ivan grabbed a towel and threw the monster out the window, Alejandra spent hours at the hospital getting skin grafted onto her hand. Ivan went home and slept for hours due to exhaustion. When he awoke, staring across from him was Gaston. Except this time, Gaston was the size of a bowling ball with horns on his head. He also had something furry sticking out of his mouth. As Ivan slowly made his way towards Gaston for a closer look, he gagged and jumped back in horror. It was the paw of his orange cat. Ivan's parents appeared at his door when they heard the commotion. And much to his horror, he noticed that their eyes were now the same icy blue color as Gaston's. Just as Ivan's mother asked him what was wrong, a gnat flew by and she extended her tongue far beyond its normal reach and gobbled it up. His parents had somehow become hosts for whatever creature Gaston was. He realized he needed to kill Gaston in order to get his parents back to themselves. He ran to the kitchen to grab a knife, then raced back upstairs where he stabbed Gaston repeatedly, leaving severed body parts all over his room. His parents collapsed onto the floor, their eyes still blue, but now lifeless. Ivan shook his mom, but it was no use. She was gone. As he cried out in grief, he started to hear croaking again. Gaston reappeared. He was now the size of a large dog. He looked into Ivan's eyes, opened his mouth, and swallowed Ivan's dad whole. He then leapt onto Ivan's chest, pinning him to the floor. Ivan's skin started to burn. He struggled for his breath, but the frog was too strong. Ivan was consumed limb by limb. A few days later, the police showed up after getting calls about a bullfrog infestation in the neighborhood. Ivan and his parents were nowhere to be found. The only person who knew the truth was Alejandra, but nobody believed a 13-year-old, so the Book of Oc was never caught. It remains out there, hungry, waiting. They say, on still evenings, you can hear a dull croaking intended to lure its next victim into the shadows. This week's podcast stories were edited by Sarah Lukasiewicz and Janine Pipe. Narration by Blair Bathory and Stephanie Strange. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Irma Richardson. Produced by Annie Villabos. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. Gail Gilman is the executive producer.